You're listening to Food for Thought, a Food Enfolded podcast. Today we're going to be discussing the subject of greenwashing. And I think that this is a pretty relevant subject and it's been relevant for the last few years. So Sylvie, if you want to take it away. Um, thank you. So yeah, I think that uh, today we could explore not only what greenwashing really is, which is very hard to define because it can yeah. do many things, but also we can uh, maybe try to find together some tools uh, to spot it somehow. It's very hard, mm -hmm. but uh, between what our audience thinks, um, because they gave us actually quite, quite interesting suggestions, and between you know what we've been doing in our personal lives, maybe we can we can figure yeah. something out. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So maybe we could start by defining greenwashing. And I actually wanted to bring up this uh, definition uh, by the Oxford Dictionary because greenwashing was introduced in the Oxford Dictionary uh, for the first time in 1999, so quite a long time ago. And uh, the Oxford Dictionary defines it as disinformation disseminated by an organization so as to present an environmentally responsible public image. Um, now, I think that maybe we should broaden up the discussion and see what we think about this definition, if that's yeah. what we mean when we talk about greenwashing. Uh, Jane, do you want to go first? Sure. I mean, I think, I don't know if the listener has already heard, but I did an IGTV on fair trade in terms of does it really work? And because our audience had asked us, well, is fair trade greenwashing? They, they wanted to make sure. Huh? So there I already defined greenwashing as, let me try to remember exactly what I said, but the, the general concept was that companies or, or organizations put more time and effort and money into making it appear as if they um, are doing ethical and, and um, environmental progressive actions without actually spending as much time, energy, or resources on that, um, as much as it comes across. So it's more, it's quite similar, I think, to the Oxford definition where it's the priority of image rather than action. Just to uh, come in on that, Jane, I think the, the thing for me that's really different there that the Oxford Dictionary doesn't capture really is whether or not there's any action or any change tied to mm -hmm tied to this thing so so i think there's a big difference personally between something that's just a marketing campaign so you know we are good for the environment but we're not do they we're not doing anything we're just saying that we're good for the environment versus mm. we've made this change and we're telling you that that change is good for the environment and i think for me those that's a really important distinction to make uh, mm -hmm. which your definition includes but the oxford one actually doesn't yeah I think my definition is pretty similar uh, to what you both both guys have been saying, but I also think that there's a there's a word that should almost be there, which is delay. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that one member of our audience actually told us uh, that greenwashing is one of the major things holding us back from transitioning to sustainability. And I think that in many cases, uh, it is a practice that uh, I have been seeing companies adopting to delay the actual effort so mm -hmm. they say that they're doing something and they're doing a few small things to present themselves in a certain way to buy yeah. themselves time and this time that they buy themselves uh we need to figure out whether they're actually you know using it to implement uh, more radical strategies to become more sustainable or if they're just trying to get away with it <laughs> so mm -hmm. i think that's uh you know the it is a it is a form of delayed response to the changes that need to happen, and or more like maybe delayed responsibility. Yes, I think it kind of comes down to our companies um, focusing on like the biggest environmental issue that at, at the center of what they do, or are they focusing on kind of the dressing around the sides, which is easier to address but doesn't necessarily. What, you know, the impact of which is very small compared to the main model of business which they operate in. Exactly. That's, for me, kind of the difference there. Yeah. I've got a, probably got a very lay audience um, perception of greenwashing. I've never actually really bothered, to be honest, looking up and defining it. Mm. Um, but that sounds like a very accurate reflection of what I think. I'm, I'm sort of aligned with you, Jane. I think I'm, I'm on the fence about whether I think it's... Uh, oh, well, I'm not, even, I'm not even on the fence. I, I, do, I do think it is more of an image thing. So I, I kind of probably narrow it down to being a, a disproportionate representation, I think, of what is actually being done. So if, if there's a very small change that's being made, 
if that is represented in a disproportionate manner to what is actually to what effect that is actually creating then i think to me that is greenwashing so if mm. they're saying okay we're we're making this tiny change and this is we're going to put this on the front of every one of our products and that yeah. change is something that is proportionally doing very little but yeah. then making a lot from it then that to me is falling yeah. within marketing and falling within greenwashing actually Oli, uh, i read a, a report saying that uh, most companies which write something on their packaging about the environmental changes that they're applying to their production actually are inflating their message. So they are a little bit sens sensationalizing what they're doing. So it's, it's, it's almost like you could, greenwashing could also be that you're doing something and you're doing something good, but you're just presenting it as much more than it is. Um, mm. And you can do it to, the, to, to several degrees. So I guess, you know, there would be a degree of greenwashing where you're just being slightly inaccurate uh, for marketing purposes, but there could be a degree of greenwashing where you're, it's purely marketing and there's nothing happening as, as Aaron was also saying earlier. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's, it happens in most times, most times actually. But I think I would like to also clarify because I think the term greenwashing, it sounds more that it's like environmentally focused, but I think that at least from my perspective, it also includes an ethical perspective as well on, on, communities. Um, and because we've seen in the food industry, in the food system, that there's been a lot of uh, inequities and a lot of people being exploited as well. So I do think that greenwashing isn't just about green, you know, it's not just about the environment. It's also about the, the social side of the food system as well. Although I will say when it comes to greenwashing, I am personally more critical of bigger companies that try to do it than smaller companies. Like I tend to believe smaller companies or what I perceive to be smaller companies, maybe they're not actually that small, but if they on their packaging have written something a little bit more uh, eco-friendly or socially mindful, you know, I'm more inclined to believe them than let's say some bigger actors in, in the food system. I think that we all know. Uh, <laughs> it's like, yeah, you know, we're trying to save water here. And I'm like, okay, but what about this? You know, so I don't know how you guys feel about it, but personally, for me, I'm just I know I'm more critical when it's a bigger company. Yeah, and actually, can I bring in a, com a comment from our audience? So mm. one person in the how to spot it, but I think it's relevant here says yeah. companies that sell both green and non-green, like selling fair trade and non-fair trade, and I think that that's uh, something that has to do with the core values of a business. So when you say a small company who is already sustainability oriented, who was born to make things a different way, to me also is more trustworthy than a big corporation that has been doing things in a very unsustainable way and then comes out with a, with a line of sustainable products. And I'm not mm -hmm. saying that that's necessarily wrong or that they shouldn't be doing that because everyone needs to start from somewhere. But yeah. I think that uh, it is more greenwashing than, than other <laughs> situations. For yeah, sure. but at the same time, like what if, because, you know, my my assumption of this smaller company is that they were born out of maybe a sustainable movement. But what if it's actually just, this is me being cynical again, but what if yeah. it's actually just a, a business, I'm a man or a woman who wants to just yeah. capitalize off of the sustainability movement that's happening. You know, Absolutely. I go I go to bio shops, organic shops, if you're in the US or in the US, you know, you have Whole Foods or Sprouts and you see how much more expensive these these green goods are, you know? And I mean, I think again, there is there is a case to be made that um, we, do, we should actually be, be paying more for our products, that our products shouldn't actually be this cheap. But there's also a question is that, is it actually supposed to be that expensive or is there kind of a profit kind of thing happening there that's also greenwashing, you know, but that we just don't interpret it that way because we assume that it's small. And and I, th I think I'm going to be the controversial one here who comes out in what's going to look like defense of big business, um, which I don't really want to be doing. I, th I think, for example, Sylvia, going back to that point around companies that produce something that's fair trade and not fair trade, I think the problem there is that as long as there's a market for, you know, the cheaper food or the non-fair trade option, as long as there are people who don't care how their chocolate is made, as long as it's cheap, then someone who stops producing that chocolate will just be replaced by someone else in the same way that, 
you know, there's a market for more sustainable, more expensive chocolate. So you have companies producing that now as well to fill that niche. And mm-hmm. so I think I, I slightly, I, I do, I, I struggle slightly with the idea of blaming companies for producing Trying things to. that have having that literally exist because we wanted them to produce those things. Um, I, mean, I think I was going to say bottled water here is a really good example, right? Mm-hmm. Like um, there are companies that produce bottled water who are, you know, trying to, you know, using recyclable plastic and um, recycled plastic and using less plastic in their bottled water. And there's an argument to say like, well, you know, why are you just not producing bottled water? Because that's the problem is you're producing all this plastic for something we don't need, Mm -hmm. but people want to buy bottled water. So like, yeah, there's a demand for it. There's a demand for it. So you and if without addressing that demand, you can never have a like, it's impossible to have a fully green plastic bottled water company. Absolutely. I think that, you know, uh, we tend to represent sometimes these big companies as if they were this sort of conspiracy, but actually they have just been providing what we've been asking for for decades. So absolutely. And I, I mean, think- they've built their business off of that. They're, they're, they're huge now because there is such a big demand for it. So yeah, I think that then when you reach a certain point, it yeah. becomes a lot of different things, but, uh, yeah. but definitely that's how they, they started. And I think that um, and and we are what keeps them alive for sure uh, by buying their products. But at the same time, I think that uh, greenwashing, I we tend to look at things in a very black or white way these days. And yep. so even greenwashing is kind of like we can't look at things like either green or white or whatever. Like I think that greenwashing is itself a spectrum, and we mm-hmm. should identify, we should realize that. And instead of saying that is greenwashing, so. Uh, I'm not going to endorse it in any possible way. Maybe mm. within levels of greenwashing, we can understand what deserves our attention and our support. And I think really the challenge there is is kind of saying like, anything this company says is greenwashing. Exactly. That is a, immediately a problem because yeah. for, for me, that approach says you remove all incentive for that massive company to make any positive changes. Yeah. And then if you do that, then you're you're taking out a player from the game who can have a huge impact like yeah. Yeah, i'm pretty yeah. sure taking a gram of plastic off one of each of coca-cola's drinks bottles will have mm-hmm. a massive impact coming back to cost as well i think that's another one that we probably ignore when we when we buy into those things like a small company and we think oh god it's it's so expensive there's also the consideration of like economies of scale right these companies are producing a, f- a billion of the same product well then they can certify and sell that product even if it's the same certification probably for a lot less mm. uh, than a company that's very small and producing it locally and has you know a very small scale right so perhaps that's also what you're paying for when you're paying for those small smaller business products yeah yeah it doesn't necessarily true. mean in my opinion at least i don't think that necessarily means that the bigger products and their uh, their certifications are, are less valuable yeah that's the problem I'm- isn't it it's so hard that's the thing. It's like, I think yeah. as a consumer, personally, this is this is not me as like editor in chief, but me as Jane. But personally, I don't like if I see a brand like from a big company at at a store, even if I know that they are trying to make real strides in um, making, you know, living income um, achievable or if they are, you know, trying to trying to be more environmentally minded with their ingredients and source it in responsible ways. Even so, if I still see their logo logo on the back of a package, I'm like, eh, I don't really want it. <laughs> like, I just, I feel like I want to invest my my money in in something that I feel I feel, and I I, I don't even know a hundred percent, right? But something that I feel mm. is is guaranteed to not be greenwashing. But I do understand how that's actually not fair, and that doesn't actually help change the system in in the sense of investment, right? Because I think that. As a consumer, what I'm doing is I'm investing my money when I'm paying for something. I'm saying I'm investing in your company to do better, right? Or in this case, I mean, I know most people don't shop that way, but I think that we need to start thinking in that way because our money does actually have an impact in driving that demand, um, which actually does Mm. drive company practices. But I don't know. I do think that I'm a bit conflicted as well because I do know that there are companies that, you know, they get like they really you know take take a brutal brutal beating in the public um public eye no matter what they do no matter yeah. what they do 
they will be perceived as, no, nah, you're not doing enough, you know? Oh, you're just greenwashing. But it's okay, then at what point will we kind of be accepting of them actually trying to to make a difference, you know? Yeah. So maybe here we could go a little bit because I think, so maybe yeah. this is the right time to to go to the how to spot it because mm -hmm. we've been talking about our perceptions of it, but maybe mm -hmm. there are a few things that we can look at uh, in order to yeah. to spot the worst cases of greenwashing. So shall we start from a few uh, comments from our public, let, let's, yes. from our what audience. What did our audience say? <laughs> so, well, first thing, someone said, I wouldn't really know what red flags to look for. <laughs> yep. I am in the same boat, uh, if I'm honest. Yeah, agreed. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, then let's see. And this other person said, even with a master's degree and working as a sustainability analyst, it's very hard sometimes. So mm. definitely. All right. So now let's see. This is a very good one because it says using the words green, sustainable or environmentally friendly on packages and in ads. And this is something that I have definitely been paying attention to because um, one thing is to, so one, one thing to define uh, greenwashing is just by saying that it's empty claims, right? There's marketing claims that are actually just, they're impossible to verify. So for me, it's very important that when I'm trying to buy sustainably, I can verify um, whether they are actually doing something. And the way to verify it, for example, is to buy specific uh, certified products that you know are being regulated and checked by independent third party sources. Uh, but if a, if a product has on its label environmentally sustainable, what can you check about that? Who is going to check anything? And I think I a really key think. part of that, Sylvia, that's a really interesting point is is kind of the specificity of the claim, right? So yeah. so it's impossible to legally enforce this is an environmentally friendly product because there's no definition for that. But yeah. if, if a company writes on its product, you know, um, we are paying farmers in these areas 25% more than the national average for those farmers in that area. You can That's, check that. You can check that fact. And obviously you may not be able to check that fact as a consumer and you may not have time to, and that's fine. But the point is that that would be illegal for them to be lying about in a way that this product is environmentally friendly isn't. So I think the more rewarding specific information that actually tells you, because also that gives you a lot more information about how much of a difference that thing is making, not just it's making an arbitrary unknown quantity difference. Exactly. What do you guys think? I'm a bit, I'm also a bit conflicted about this because on one hand, for example, I know that a lot of big companies have annual reports, but then it, the question is, well, can you, can you rely on those reports? You know, but even, even legislation. So I, I know that policy right now, it's a bit difficult because they don't actually require companies to report on this. This is actually more of a, like a, like a voluntary thing. Yeah, exactly. It's a voluntary thing. And I think for the companies that do actually do the reporting, I mean, they're they're spending so much time writing up a report that how many how many consumers will really read that report? You know, so for me, but I also don't know. Like, are they doing it because they know that it'll look good if just in case somebody does look it up? You know, so there, this, this is also still cynicism uh, on my part. Whereas you could kind of look at it both ways, right? You could either look at it in that cynical way, or you could look at it as they're actually trying to be responsible and they're not saying that their their system is perfect, you know? But at the same time, oh no, don't worry. I, I'll just finish up with that. Some of these reports that I've read are still framed in a positive way. Like I realized that companies never really report on the negative side of things, or if they do, they always frame it in a positive way way that doesn't make them look too bad. And for me, I do think that that's kind of, if we're looking at the spectrum of greenwashing, that's still a little bit on the greenwashing side, you know? It's like, mm. I feel like companies are so afraid to say when they've messed up, but I actually think that as a consumer, I would respect them more if they acknowledge that, look, we aren't perfect, but we're trying to get somewhere, you know? And I've seen companies do that and they have massive respect for me. And it doesn't actually lose me as a as a customer at all. But yeah, so just my two cents. Yeah. So Jay, I was going to, so first thing I was just going to quickly say to your first point was um, that 
there's kind of obviously you talked about investing your money as a consumer when you buy a product but Mm -hmm. there's also could be there can be greenwashing going on at the kind of investor level in terms of actual investment in the company directly so Mm -hmm. a, a report on slavery might be you know potentially geared at getting onto a sustainable investing list that means more people put money into that company so there's that kind of angle to think about it as well Mm -hmm. um and then i was just gonna just i'll hand over to you as a sex silvio i was just gonna quickly say i think you're completely right about um the value of companies actually engaging with the problems that they have and owning up to those things and talking getting a chance to talk about them on their terms to say Mm -hmm. yes this is a problem these are the reasons and the challenges of why we haven't solved this problem yet and these are the things we're trying to do about that and i think we're we're a we're a mature enough um group of consumers now there is a mature enough group of consumers to really engage with that and i think that's something i'd love to see more of as well Hmm. sorry yeah so no about your um your comment on investments and greenwashing that's huge and the eu um in june 2020 so less than a year ago has actually approved a new new regulations on how to define greenwashing for Mm -hmm. investors Mm -hmm. so maybe this is a bit interesting um so the new legislation lays down six environmental objectives if you with your company Uh, are contributing to mitigating, to reaching some of these objectives. Uh, And while doing so, you're not harming any of the other objectives, then you can be considered environmentally sustainable. I'll I'll read you out the six objectives. Climate change mitigation, climate change adaptation, sustainable use and protection of water and marine resources, transition to a circular economy, pollution prevention and control, protection and restoration of biodiversity and ecosystems. The reason why this is good is that until last year, uh, insurance companies like pension funds could could choose any investment saying that this was a green investment just based on what they thought was Mm. a green investment. Whereas now we have the EU setting out regulation to say, look, you can't say that anything is green. Mm. I think that... um definition set from the eu is is a massive step forward and really really helpful but it's always the same challenge right of like it kind of kicks the problem of definition a bit down the road because my first question was going to be what does not contributing to climate change mean like exactly does that mean you have to be climate you have to be carbon neutral otherwise you're not on this list what about certification programs all this it gets so complicated Mm. absolutely it's so hard to define but this this shows how much people could just like say anything, right? Like if this is still a very broad definition, it means that you need to be at least doing something. And maybe mm. people were considering something green when when the company was actually doing nothing. Yeah, I'm I'm totally with you, Aaron. I think that I think that's kind of vague in my opinion. I don't I don't think that really defines that much. I don't think that really helps a consumer actually understand what they're investing in or an investor understand what they're investing in. And I don't really think that it per, this is just pure personal opinion i don't know if this is uh founded or not but from what i hear it doesn't sound like that's stopping people from uh from greenwashing their investments at all like it just sounds like you just have to tick one box now it's just a defined box you know but it still is a vague box from which i I assume the definitions are 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 fairly loose given they're very big topics you know climate change is a very very broad topic to be to be ticking yeah, Arguably, absolutely. climate change isn't even a topic. It's just everything. <laughs> but this is just in the EU, right? Like, I think my yeah, problem so is that so EU. many big companies are international. And what I see is that, okay, they might be more responsible, for example, in in what we can say Western countries or higher income countries. But I've had conversations with friends who, even small businesses, when they migrate to another country and open up something there, they cut corners, you know? So for me... It's, I, I think that this is one step towards the right direction because you want to hold, you have to have some kind of accountability, but I would like to see something on a, a more international scale, actually. Um, Definitely. And that, that companies, I mean, I also understand companies are huge, you know, they're not, they have like different, uh, what do they call them? Like uh, arms? No, nah, arms. Yeah, division, yeah, divisions are, I was going to say franchises, but that's not really, but it kind of, I don't know. I don't kind know. The, it kind of is. But sometimes they're so detached from what's happening there that they don't, they actually don't know what's going on. But I do feel that as a, as a company, that is part of your responsibility. 
Um, and again, it comes back down to owning up to that. Like, okay, you know what? Logistically speaking, maybe you 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 might not understand how how our company works and how we branch out and how we have extensions, but they're still under our name. They're still operating under our name. So we accept that responsibility. And here's what we're actually going to try to do about it. Um, but I would love to see. I don't know. I know that Germany has actually a new supply chain law, and we have an article on that coming out by our contributor uh, Katie. So that'll be interesting. But there, it's from my understanding, it's that Germany is trying to hold all its uh, like not all, but the companies responsible for its entire supply chain. So even for the aspects that aren't just here in Europe, but even if you know something is is uh, made in, I don't know, Bangladesh or made in China, for example, that they are still responsible for it. And it's amazing to have a law like that. But of course, the issue with a law like that is always going to be enforcement, isn't it? For sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I think I as a consumer, so if we're going back to kind of the labels and the certifications, right? I will say that there are some certifications that I do trust. And I, I will say that it's because I've actually done research about them. And I won't, I won't come and claim and say I've looked at all the certification labels out there because there's just so many of them. But the biggest ones for me, like fair trade, I, I, I actually do trust um, because I was very pleasantly surprised after I, I wrote my article and found that it actually works. Like, and it's not 100% effective, you know, like I don't think any certification system can guarantee 100% because Again, the system is so big and interconnected and so many aspects of it. And traceability is already a huge issue in the food system. So there is not a 100% guarantee. But what I can see is that in the model that they have, they're really making strides forward, right? And so that's just one certification label. But I do think that as a consumer, it also is our responsibility to look it up. Like I will admit that, okay, I see UTZ or I see Rainforest Alliance and you assume that that's good. You know, like you assume that that's like helpful in some shape or form, but do I actually know? No, <laughs> you know, and I do think that it's up to us to actually look, look things up. But at the same time, I don't actually think even the most conscious consumers, they don't always do that. Or let's say we don't no always way. do that. It's it's just so much work, you know? And I don't know, I would love to hear if our audience would be interested in like hearing us deep dive into different labels and, you know, interviewing people from the labels, interviewing maybe people that are critical of these labels as well. Um, because I do think that this is very important for us as consumers to know. Um, and like a very easy, accessible place. I don't know. There's just so I, many things going on at the supermarket. So, <laughs> yeah, I think that mm -hmm. the problem with labels, uh, I mean, there are a few problems with labels in that some labels tend to operate as, you know, their their business model could skew a little bit their mm. uh, objectivity in certain cases. And the other, of course, issue, big issue is the auditing issue with uh so For not sure. enough transparency, because the only way you can guarantee something is by verifying it a few times. By an independent um, third party as well. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. But then, you know, sometimes the auditing is, so these checks uh, are, are announced in advance, which means mm -hmm. that certain, uh, you know, certain companies, uh, producers could hide the malpractice in advance or something like that. But even, yeah. even if it wasn't announced and you found a certain situation, you couldn't guarantee that that's what happens 100% of the time. So that's another problem. But I think that that's, that problem specifically could be solved potentially thanks to more, more transparency, more mm. controls, more, the imposition maybe of, of certain ways of technologically track stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, cameras, uh, GPS, now, now I'm thinking about oh man boats. I know but at the same time yeah. it's a little um, bit like Big Brother as well you know like 1984 yeah I think that I, I, I hate to be on the side of people trying to get these sustainability labels but I, 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 I can sympathize with the fact that I think we are an incredibly tough crowd like we're not, not even just a discerning consumer I think trying to actually get one emblem that gets on a label uh, if we're talking about if we're just talking about say food labels if we're trying to get one emblem on a label that people can immediately look at and associate with a certain uh, a certain certification that is guaranteed, proven, triple checked kind of thing, you are fighting against a flood of a hundred other labels that are yeah. sticking things on. So it, I, I do sympathise with the fact that whether they are people doing the right thing or wrong thing, 
there are going to be people taking advantage of that. I think there will be people taking advantage of the confusion, you know, like yeah. people will be pushing those, uh, those worst labels or less verified labels because it's easy. They know that it's easy to confuse conf- consumers. We're all confused by it. I can go on. I consider myself as someone that's very discerning with seafood, especially, and I'll, I can look at a, a can of fish and I'll, I promise you, I will know 50% of the labels on there. Yeah. And I probably won't check what the other ones are. I actually just, I just will not. I might, I might not believe them, but I just look at them all and I just think, well, yeah. there's just too much. Like there's, I don't think anyone has the, yeah. the energy to do that with think, every product. Yeah, I think it's a really great point, Ollie, and I, and I kind of don't it's, – it's frustrating because in some ways I don't think as consumers we shouldn't need to be fighting, you know, basically dishonesty from big companies who are trying to mm. – like you said, take advantage of confusion or like use misinformation in order to boost the bottom line. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, I think like the the thing that I'm hearing from all of us is that really we want to promote what we want is a world where companies are actually open and transparent and quite honest about what they're doing and the problems they're facing and not just virtue signaling and using stuff to their advantage. Yeah. The challenge is how do we encourage exactly. that world when companies mm. want to make money and, yeah, like, and, and it's a very difficult the government do that yeah. but i think yeah. it's a bit idealistic of us right like i think we are a very niche group of people and i think that's quite hard to believe especially if we're surrounded by people who are conscious about what they consume and even our our audience the majority of them are quite conscious you know but we're just a very minor group in a sea of consumers and the thing is is that for me it's a bit idealistic for us to to want companies to want to have a positive impact, you know, like, but if you think about the world of business, the world of business is on, on its foundation is about generating a profit, making making strides for yourself, right? So for us to kind of expect all businesses to want to have a positive impact comes from our values. But at the same time, I do think that these are values that are good to strive towards, and in a way, I, I would hope that businesses are in line with those values because no one wants to buy anything that's that had like child exploitation. You know, no one wants to buy something that that's killing dolphins. Let's say like that's usually the biggest thing that people you know like to show. But I I do I do also think that by working with you know bigger companies who supply a lot of these food products to people that aren't in our group. They're the ones that actually create a systematic change so that there is actually a larger impact beyond just the niche group of conscious consumers. I think that it's a, it's a very good point, the one about values. And I think that, uh, you know, you can see, you can try to solve the problem by adding more CCTV cameras. And that's the little mm. patch on the issue that doesn't really solve the problem from within. And then there's the there's the bigger you know picture, which is kind of changing incentives and changing what we really value in society. So maybe what we value is not anymore growth. Maybe it's a sustainable kind of growth within certain limits. And that's what gets uh, what becomes most valued in society and what Mm. everyone starts to strive towards. But I think that it, it definitely is a problem that is not limited to greenwashing, not limited to the food industry. It's it's such a big problem at a at a bigger scale. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. will require very significant uh, quality value. change in the way that yeah. we look at at life and and yeah. society and what yeah. And, and you know, it's just towards. funny because I, I think that you know we've heard in in the last maybe few years it's uh, kind of this battle on on capitalism, <laughs> um, and I think it's it's really interesting. Um, and I I I would say that I was kind of more in that boat as well. But I've also seen how capitalism can also change things for the better, you know? Um, So I feel that we have a broken system, but for me, it's personally, it's not about like completely abolishing that system. It's working with what it already is because our systems are so, so complicated, so complex. We have so many different aspects um, that are, are part of it that we don't see, you know? And I think that just, completely saying, all right, let's tear the system down and create something from nothing. You know, that's, that's very, very difficult to do. Maybe there's something Absolutely. to that, you know, but I, I, so I want to bring up this, like, uh, I don't know anything about economics, not much. 
So I am totally ignorant. So I, I really want to hear what Aaron thinks about this. But mm. I've heard uh, about this uh, theory by Kate Raworth, I think, from Oxford, uh, which is the donut theory. Oh, I economics. think we talked about this too. Yeah. yeah. So you can't go beyond a certain level of growth. You can't go below that or something like that. Aaron maybe will be able to explain it better. But it, it could be a way to look at things that is, is new. Um, and yeah, absolutely. And I think, to be honest, I think Ollie nailed it with one word, which is governments. And I think this level of regulation has to come from a government level. Um, but the, the and governments need to be less obsessed with maximum growth all of the time forever, because that just it just can't work. It, it's un completely unsustainable as a model. And for, for me, I think the, the, to come to your point, Jane, about capitalism, absolutely. Like capitalism has lifted huge numbers of people out of poverty, given us so much innovation. And the thing I always think is you look at how great an incentive making money is like people will do all sorts of insane stuff to make money. These companies are, <laughs> yeah. you know, doing things that probably keep them up at night in order to make more money. Well, mm. what if we can turn that incentive into something that drives them to do good? You know, you say... Mm. You know, you start putting in things like carbon um, caps and, and credits in order to tax companies who are over polluting. Suddenly you're saying you're going to lose all of your money if you don't do something about this pollution problem. They're going to do something about it. Mm. And actually, mm -hmm. the thing you have to sacrifice there is that in the short term, you'll have less growth because you're not yeah. expensing everything in the planet in order for more growth. And yeah. so for, mm. for me those the specifics of those regulations are incredibly complicated and incredibly difficult and specific to every industry but yeah. ultimately at the root of all of it is exactly what sylvia is saying like governments need to change what is ideal and ideal needs to be growth within these limits but and actually it's... too Sorry, much but... growth is just as bad as too little that's that's the change yeah. that needs to happen psychologically i think but you know what's so funny is that now that like me being in this position, I've worked with different actors in different parts of the food system or there's people from government, there's companies, there's startups, there's NGOs, there's, you know, consumers, and everybody is passing off the responsibility to the other. The government thinks that it's up to companies. The companies think that, well, we have to hear from the consumers if that's what they want. And it's like, we, it's so clear, like, Everybody in government, everybody in, in business, they're all consumers too. What do you want as a consumer? What do you want as an individual for this world, right? And I think that, okay, for some people, it is about making money. It is about making profit. And that's that's fine. You know, I think that we all grow up with different values, but making profit should not be, like, it doesn't have to just be about making profit. You can have profit, but you can also have equality and justice in the in the work that you do. I don't know that they necessarily go hand in hand without incentives. I think that incentives need to need to be there for that. Yeah, but, and, but and at that's the same my time... idealism, right? Like looking look in but your think... heart. Like <laughs> yeah, I think it's idealistic, but I think that there are levels, as Aaron says, there are levels to growth, right? Like mm. it's it's just that's actually just smart business. Like you're gonna have to look at that from a, like a pragmatic perspective there you can only grow so much and if 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 you it, it depends how essentially it depends how greedy you want to be right like if you want to just make this purely about profit and you want to grow until you're absolutely enormous and everything is out of your control as that operator of that business mm. well you can try and do that but of course you're going to end up shooting yourselves in the feet later down the down later down the line but there's nothing to say that you can't scale your business so you're making a profit but you're also doing the right thing, but that profit has somewhat of a ceiling, you know? You're not constantly evolving. You're not constantly going further and further and further and further. Mm -hmm. There are, like, there is, I think, a threshold where a lot of people now are actually happily sitting in that threshold, especially small businesses where they're saying, look, we're willing to work on our ideals and we're going to prioritize them above making a lot of profit. We still want to make profit. It's a business, but we don't need to make an excessive amount of profit where that is the only objective. And I think mm. that, I think I've seen a lot of shift in that. Like a, a lot more small businesses are shifting towards that sort of a model. And yeah. that's kind of the birth of the social enterprise really, isn't it? To say, yes, we're profit making, but we're doing it with a vision and we're not willing to sacrifice that vision for more profit. And yeah. it's that value attachment that's really key. Yeah, I totally agree, Ali. Totally. Going back to how to spot greenwashing, someone wrote... Anything related to ecology on animal-based products is hypocrisy. hypocrisy. Uh, and so, you, so, so basically, it's a uh, you. You should just buy plant-based, is what it's saying. 
Yes. And okay. I do have some concerns about that because actually the problem right now, so they are right in saying that right now it's impossible to tell which animal product is uh, more mm. sustainable or not, unless you know exactly on your own uh, the, the whole, you can trace on your own the like product. If, if back it comes from to, a specific farm. Yeah, if it comes it, to your own, from your own farm. That, and I think mm -hmm. that at the moment it's impossible to tell that. But mm. it's not true that it wouldn't be possible to tell that because um, Poor and Nemechek have published this huge seminal paper in 2018 in Science where they identified high and low impact producers of, of animal products. Mm. And uh, they realized something like uh, one fourth of the beef industry is responsible for more than half of all of the environmental damage linked to the sector. So mm. they, they were saying that if we halved our uh, meat consumption and we only source from low impact producers, then we would reach very high uh, percentages of of sustainability similar not not as much as a vegan diet but we could reach up to 70 percent of the ecological benefits of a vegan diet in certain circumstances so yes i think that at the moment it's really hard to tell uh, whether something is produced more or less sustainably um, in terms of animal products but one day with uh, increased transparency and uh, you know a system to 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 categorize that we might have like green or yellow or red labels that don't even come from the company but they come from a higher level of you know from an independent third party mm. uh che checking or something yeah. like that that but could I, be able to tell us that but i also think that this comes back down to the supply chain i think that in this case at grocery stores all the meat that you see it's actually probably not from one farm it's from a collection of farmers and it's sold to a supplier who then sells it. And, you know, there's all these parts of the supply chain. Um, so I, I do think that, yes, there is a case for low impact meat production. But then I do also think that then that's on the suppliers to supply it from low impact meat producers. So, so what you're saying, Jane, is as consumers at the moment, you don't even, even if that data existed and the label existed as a consumer, you still wouldn't have a choice because yeah. it would be one low impact chicken breast and three high impact chicken breast in the same packet. Exactly. It looks like that's pointing us in the direction of categorizing food groups rather than specific products as a means to actually be sure about your impact. I think in terms of data, I think that's where we're at right now. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can. I would say for me, I think that probably won't, if you take meat as an example, that probably won't change until demand for meat is lower and the price of meat is higher. And therefore there's more incentive to do it in a more bespoke and differentiated way for individual products rather than yeah. producing the stuff in bulk. I think but that's also, going to be the But also there's still a huge difference between what you can find in a supermarket and what you can find from a butcher, for example, because from a butcher, the supply chain might be much shorter, which mm -hmm. means that it might be much more traceable than the supply chain of a huge supermarket chain. There's no like intermediate people because that's the problem, right? Like you have mm. supplier going to supplier, going to supplier who then goes to the farmer. Whereas in this case, there's a direct relationship between the farmer and the supplier. Everything that is, produ is sold by that supplier is produced by that farmer. It's very easy to trace that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I think the, maybe my question was, is that assumption? Because I'm just thinking, I, I mean, I don't know. This is really just a, a question, a very general yeah. question, because <laughs> I, I don't know. Well, because I don't eat meat, you know, but <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if butchers actually don't buy it from a supplier who doesn't actually know who he's also supplying from but just knows that it's quality meat you know i i, I don't I think personally it know massively that. depends on the individual butcher i think you've yeah. got everything Absolutely. from you know an artisanal bespoke has it you could even be the farmer that is the butcher it might be a farm yeah. shop yeah. you know it could That's even be small a smaller chain but on the same side you would like you know tesco's has a butcher's counter and they're not operating like that and a lot of butchers will be operating on that same model of getting meat from whichever supplier makes the most sense and yeah. not prioritizing that traceability. So again, it's a case by case basis, I think. But this helps enough to confute that uh, argument that anything said about sustainability related to animal products is false. That's not I true. Will, I will say though, if I'm putting myself in the mind of the person who wrote that, I mean, this is also an assumption. If I'm wrong, please feel free to direct message us. Um, but I think the idea is that if I'm a consumer and I do want to lower my environmental footprint, 
the best way possible is actually to to avoid or limit your animal based product um, intake, right? So I think when we're talking about greenwashing as a concept, yeah, we're also talking about labels. But I think that as a consumer, why do we care about greenwashing? We care about greenwashing because we don't want to buy products that aren't what we think is sustainable, right? We want to buy actual sustainable products that are consciously produced, that are uh, well sourced, and I think that from that mindset, I can understand why this person maybe wrote that. You know, absolutely. I just, might, I just be, think that yeah. these are kind of separate topics, though, and I think that it's very easy to just put everything in the yeah in the cauldron I, I, and just be yeah. like, yeah, everything's green. What, like, you know what I mean? For it's sure, just... for sure. I mean, I, I totally understand. Um, I think I was just clarifying because I yeah. think. I think we are also talking about greenwashing in a very like almost slightly philosophical way, you know, like a slightly abstract way. But I think to remember why people care about greenwashing um, and that intention behind it, I think in the end, the the choice is because we want to make the best sustainable choice possible, right? Yeah. I think the other part of that is, you know, what you're saying about, you know, as a consumer, if what you want is to make change, then you need to limit your meat intake, Mm -hmm. not you know, look for a more sustainable beefsteak, perhaps. Then I think there's also that point of like, we as consumers need to be careful about doing our own greenwashing about our own lives and what we choose to do. So, you know, Mm. (laughs) are you switching from cow's milk to almond milk and therefore having this really warm, fuzzy feeling, but you don't necessarily know if that's the most sustainable solution and it's more Mm. about... It's more about the the signals that that can send, perhaps even just to yourself, perhaps not to other people. But yeah. that I think we yeah. also need to hold ourselves accountable to are we making the best possible changes that we can make in our choices? And yeah. by saying, why is my, you know, why is my meat not produced more sustainably? Are we just avoiding the issue of, well, perhaps I shouldn't be buying it and eating it in the first place? Absolutely. It's like, oh, you know, I'm rejecting the plastic straw at the pub, but then I eat like meat three times a week or, or something. Or I, or I drive, a, <laughs> drive a four by four two, mi- two minutes down the road to go to the shop. Yeah, exactly. But um, I have one last point that I would like to touch about greenwashing actually, which mm-hmm. is the difference between in-house certifications and independent certifications. And I tend to trust less in-house, uh, in-house certifications <laughs> because it's like, yeah, I'm just doing it all myself. I'm just... Uh, saying that this is sustainable and you can trust me for that. And I, I think it's amazing to to still have something like that because it, it increases accountability. I can come to you and say, now I want you to show me that, that that's what you said because you made very specific statements and that's what we were talking about earlier with, with Aaron too. But I think that um, if I had to choose between in-house and independent, I would probably trust more independent because of yeah. the process because I've, the process is more is more trustworthy to me i've i've got a, i've got a, i'm gonna <laughs> i'm gonna throw a cat amongst the pigeons here um, oh. <laughs> I, I actually think that uh i don't know i don't really know what to think about it. i think it really depends on uh depends on what kind of third party you're actually looking at because i've i've actually experienced the better of, i've experienced both sides there were there's been internal reporting and i know the internal reporting has been really really good and I've uh, I've worked with people where I know there's been external reporting, and the reporting has been completely completely uh, ineffective. Like mm-hmm. they've, I won't name where or when this was, but there was a like a muscle farm, for example, and they had a third party auditor associated with the government that was supposed to be a very uh, thorough audit, and they would go to check for a certain uh, bacteria in these mussels so they could be sold. If they had them, then they had to be held, and they weren't allowed to be sold. Mm-hmm. And they have farms inland and they had farms out at sea where they would grow their uh, their babies essentially and um when the third party audits would come through they would just say look send us send us a bag of your product and we, we'll do the testing you know like Whoa. we do the testing yeah oh they my do God. the test so there's a there's a big difference you know you do the testing versus you are you are actually coming and just doing like a spot drug test kind of thing where they're like okay quickly now give me what you got right in front of you instead of it being like yeah. okay give us a sample of your product and we'll do the third party ordering. It's I think it I absolutely. hate this because it it, ma- it makes us skeptical of absolutely everything, yeah. but yeah. it is it, it it very much depends and I think this definitely yeah. matters depending on where you're looking at those certific- yeah. certifications around the world For sure. because it will definitely differ depending on the region and how they certify. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and yeah, that's the problem with auditing. 
it's it is yeah. the problem yeah with just but, can't, checking. can't cut corners but i yeah. do think that for in-house labels there is something to it because well, i did i spoke with somebody from fair trade about this i was like what do you think about this and it was a pleasant surprise because he was saying you know what if they're actually doing something i'm all for it you know the the the, the mm. aim of the game for the certification is just like it wasn't just to certify this it was actually to make a difference um, in the system. And if there's another system in place that's actually doing the right thing, then great. And I do think that I'm not saying that this is, you know, 100% foolproof in-house labels, there there is still critique to be done. Maybe they should introduce a third party auditor, you know. Um, but I do think it's commendable to at least set aside budget from your profit to actually start a program like that, you know, or start an initiative like that. I think the the commitment the level of the commitment we would ha kind of have to 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 be wary of, um, but I think that's a start. And I think that maybe for me as a consumer, maybe I actually would rather not see that label on a product. It, like it would say so much more to me that they're actually doing something without actually putting it on as a label. But I also understand as a company, you want to show um, your customers that you are trying to make a difference, right? And I do think that sometimes that's that could be another reason why companies put on these labels um not I necessarily think, always for greenwashing purposes yeah right? i think i think yeah we tend to assume that it's always the opposite isn't it that like yeah. they're gonna inflate uh and and say something that is yeah. more than what they're doing and yeah. to be honest i think again it goes back to incentives like we need to ask ourselves like why would this company be doing this thing in this way and um, there are, I, I think that we can assume sometimes safely that they are changing things for real since they're realizing that more and more people are becoming aware of the issues. So mm -hmm. I think that by making ourselves more and more informed about this and using our, um, our, what do you say, purchasing power, yeah. uh, I think we can incentivize, uh, companies to do better, but it can't just come from us. Yeah. Uh, it needs to come from us and then it needs to come from governments at the same time and it needs to be and the people within the company themselves you know i think Definitely. that we yeah. tend to we tend to say company and we tend to say they as if it's like this huge big thing but it's also made of people right so i think that the people within the company also have to see and try to push for that real change as well um so yeah i mean yeah. i'm for me, I am I am hopeful that change is possible. Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing at Food Absolutely. and Folded. Yeah, hundred percent. So there's like a few. It sounds like we've kind of narrowed it down to a few things. How you sort of select, being very selective of the source of the foods that you're buying. Mm -hmm. uh, if we're talking strictly about foods, maybe generalizing food groups rather than certain products because you can't necessarily be sure about transparency between them. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, yeah, I guess direct. If you want to do things like uh, or eat eat foods that are worse, and you know that they're worse, then I guess direct trade or yeah, something something similar is probably a best your best option if you want to be certain about where it's coming from. And greenwashing is a spectrum, so of course there might be a little bit of greenwashing sometimes, even when a company is doing something. And I think we shouldn't necessarily, um, you know, brush it off and just say that they're all doing bad stuff. I think that we need to look for specific things that companies are doing. If we can verify their claims, um, yeah. this is an important tip. I think it's okay for us to celebrate um, and like be happy about positive changes that happen. And I think even to some degree, if there is some greenwashing going on, if, it, if it's mild, if it's, mm -hmm. you know, yes, marketing claims with absolutely no basis behind them deserve to be criticized and condemned. And I think that's really important. But at the same time, if a company has done something positive, I think the thing that sometimes gets me quite down is a company will make a change that is absolutely a positive change. It's better to have done it than not. And they'll just come under fire for not having done enough. Or <laughs> why have you not done this other thing that I wanted you to do? Yeah. And, and, and those all may be completely valid points and they're completely valid to make. But I think we could we would all benefit from just prefacing that with well i'm really happy that this change has been made mm. in a yes no situation i'm really glad you made that change but what about this there are more that needs to be done it's not enough that's fine but i think for our sake for our own kind of um our own mental state when it comes to the state of our food system as well as supporting companies i think it's fine to celebrate some of those changes as well indeed
it's good to feel that we're all going in the right direction or that we're all trying to go into the right di right direction yeah. and eventually and, we'll... and all kind of be supporting each other rather than fighting each other every step of the way yeah and so on that point what i would be interested in hearing from our audience is what would be acceptable for you what would be the line of greenwashing versus actual change for you let us know. Let us know what you think. And yeah, you can find us online at www.foodunfolded.com, on Instagram at food.unfolded, and also here on our YouTube channel. <laughs> so stay tuned for the next editor's table. We actually talk about food habits. So kind of a correlation to, to this episode, but yeah. Bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>